SPIE presents the Advancing the Laser series, honoring 50 years of laser achievements. Hi, I'm Rox Anderson. I'm a professor at Harvard uh, Medical School, and I run the Wellman Center for Photomedicine, which is the largest lab in the world dedicated to using light for diagnosis and treatment of people. We, we just try to help solve health problems. And uh, we are working on a bunch of different uh, uh, laser-based uh, new ideas for uh, treatment and uh, diagnosis of multiple different types of diseases. I'm also a dermatologist, so I practice dermatology. I take care of uh, mostly children, and I use a lot of lasers to help them out with their skin problems. I love to uh, work uh, to improve the lives of children because, in fact, you catch them at a time when uh, nature is sort of on your side, they're growing, they heal well, and, and so forth. I think if you look very broadly at, at the impact that uh, laser and optical technology really could have in health, um, you know, cancer, you look at the, the major diseases, heart disease and cancer are, have got to be number one and two. And uh, we are actually making a lot of progress there. I'm very excited about the optical coherence tomography as a imaging tool for looking at uh, heart vessels, coronary vessels. Um, cardiologists have never been able to see what they're doing. They're, they're working blindly. Giving them eyes is a good thing to do. Um, I think uh, the, the same is true for cancer. Right now, the most sophisticated and effective way to surgically remove cancer from the body is to have the surgeon run back and forth between a microscope looking to see if he's got it all and the patient, where if he doesn't have all the tumor out, he'll cut a little bit more. Um, the opportunity to do in vivo microscopy and make that process happen in real time is, is very strong. In, in my practice, for example, in dermatology, we use a host of lasers. I probably use a dozen different types of lasers, and they're very specific to the, the problems that we're treating. So if you have uh, you know, a child with a vascular lesion you use a laser, usually a pulsed dye or alexandrite laser that's absorbed by hemoglobins and is going to affect the blood vessels that are abnormal in the skin. If you have a child whose problem is that they have a pigmented lesion, that's melanin is the absorber there. And we use a nominally Q-switched lasers, typically nanosecond domain uh, lasers, green, red, infrared, depending on the skin type. Um, other lasers that we use are some classical lasers. CO2 laser was one of the very first in the 60s, uh, that the first gas lasers that uh, came out. This is still a surgical workhorse laser. It's been configured recently uh, to do the equivalent of sort of microsurgery. We make these in, uh, detailed patterns in the tissue using an old laser with new scanning technology. So these are just some of the lasers that we use, and I'm, I'm leaving out other ones. There's a lot of interest now in solid state semiconductor diode lasers because of the high efficiency and the flexible wavelengths that, that one can obtain with them, mostly in the near infrared. So we have some high power versions of those that we use in dermatology. Lots of different lasers. I think it's interesting that you can't really practice dermatology or ophthalmology now without access to lasers. It, it, you, you literally can't do a good job without lasers. So these are mainstay tools of what we do for patients. I think the horizon is, uh, is to use a terrible phrase, I guess very bright uh, for, for lasers and, and optics in general. In the near term, I think we're going to see in medicine a lot of diagnostic applications. Uh, the, the ability to see inside the tissue and make a diagnosis using laser microscopes instead of taking a biopsy is a huge opportunity that we haven't really realized yet. So it's only in the eye that people have done sophisticated imaging, starting now in other organs. And I think over the next three to five years, you'll see that play out. Heart disease, uh, GI malignancies, all kinds of places like that. Another area, we, we actually have uh, pretty good surgical lasers. That's a highly advanced field right now. But they are all dumb devices. 
it from the point of view that uh, they are not being controlled in an active way by some feedback system. So I think there will be in medicine a another revolution that occurs when uh, optical diagnostics and imaging are used to guide lasers to do surgery. It's, I'm, not, I'm not talking about a robot, but I am talking about something that's halfway there, a, a, a very sophisticated image-guided surgical system with lasers. I think, I think lasers will be the first place that that kind of uh, paradigm exists. Um, and I think another answer I would put to this is that, that light is a wonderful tool for triggering chemistry. So if you look at the way we develop new drugs, most of our drugs work in the dark and they are intrinsically limited, therefore, to the amount of energy that's available in the chemistry. Uh, we have only a handful of light-activated drugs, and I see in the future that the, the explosion, if you will, of knowledge in molecular biology will be used to design molecules that are light-activated that have very specific and different targets. So I think those three things, probably we're going to see them come about. How soon? I don't know.